circumstances, uh, our sorrows, because Lord Jesus, you came to earth to taste our sadness so that we might taste your sweetness, so that our eyes might be open and we might see the beauty of who you are. We pray this morning as we take a little time uh, to study some Bible and theology, uh, Lord, that you would let us know that this is ours, uh, that we would grow, that you would establish us and root us in Christ. Disciple us this morning by your spirit, for we ask it, Lord Jesus, in your precious name, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Amen. Y'all be seated. A um, couple of quick things. This spread up here is incredible. And y'all need, to, y'all need to just take note of what just happened. All right? She was not going to be denied. Was not going to be denied. Y'all need to feel free to do the same thing and come right on down here and, uh, and grab you some cookies because this is an incredible spread. Uh, I spent a lot of hours baking these things, Hayden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I'm especially proud of these pumpkin chocolate chip cookies I made. It's my own special recipe. They're really good. They're really, they're, they really aren't they good. They're so, all this is amazing. Y'all, thank you for bringing this. And please, uh, as I'm teaching, just feel free to get up. And come, or maybe, Jim, maybe we should just pass the plates around. Maybe that's what we should do. Maybe just take out after my car. Okay. Yeah, you, you could just take plates around and serve everyone while we're doing that. Um, can we just take a quick second? I got, I got an announcement that we need to get made. And, um, but a couple of things. One, uh, Phil and Pam are with us this morning. And on the one hand, you, you are so bad for being here. This I told you, everybody's going to be upset with you. You came this morning, but we're just delighted to see you here. And, and when I said, what in the world are you doing here? What, what did you tell me? I said, being in God's house with his people is good medicine. Being with God's people in his house is good medicine. Yeah. Can you give us just a, an update on how we can pray, what's, what's been going on here? Well, Monday I knew I was going in for a surgery, but it turned out to be two surgeries, and I was on the table about five or six hours, so it was a long day. And um, I'm just having to take time to gain strength and energy. So y'all make sure, and you know, I don't know if she can, all of you can come hug her neck, that might be a little much for her, but just... And, and here's the thing, sometimes I'm tempted to skip church because I'm having a bad hair day. <laughs> and I know what some of y'all are thinking, well, David, that's the case you'd never come to church because it's not often that, that good. But I mean, two surgeries this week and, um, we and yet, we had a bad Monday. I know, right? And yet here, here they are. So y'all, we love y'all so much. And also need to let you know that uh, Philip Noble is still in New York in the hospital. I talked with Leslie just a bit ago, and he is still in the hospital. Um, it turns out his kidney is not being rejected, so praise God for that. It appears that there was an, uh, a reaction to the medication, but they needed to get him up there to, to figure that out. She's hopeful that he'll be back in the middle of this week. Probably won't be able to be among us uh, for a little bit, but of course, we're not gonna have Sunday school for a couple of weeks after today, so hopefully after the turn of the year, he'll be back and be with us, but please continue to pray for them. Uh, you can only imagine how wearying a season this has been for them back and forth in New York and just the fear and everything involved um, has been a, really an anxiety-ridden season for them. So pray, pray for them. And, and for their children, yeah, especially for their children, just seeing dad go back and forth. It's just been a lot of upheaval this year in a lot of, a lot of ways. So um, pray, pray for them. Also, Luke, if you come here, babe, I want to get you to make an announcement. We had last night an incredible uh, young adults gathering over at the home of Julie and Will Mayfield. They were so gracious to open up their beautiful home, and we had a great young adults gathering. Uh, I was there because I'm often mistaken for a young adult myself. And, <laughs> and, um, and now they're like, what's the creepy old guy doing here? But anyway, it was just a great time. Uh, the, all the young adults got together. And so Luke's going to make an announcement, and then um, Gabby will take any information from any of the young adults. If you want to get on the list to know what's going on and uh, be in the communications loop, Gabby will take your info. But Luke, tell us what's happening. Yeah. Don't believe him for a second that he didn't want to be there. He was the first to pick a gift in White Elephant, so that's just the thing to do. Uh, but yeah, we, I know Corey talked about it a week or two ago, but we have a young adults group starting up. Uh, we really believe that it's something that we've needed for a long time here. Uh, we're really, really excited. We're going to be going over screw tape. So if you know a young adult 
or you are a young adult, uh, feel free to reach out to Gabby, myself, or really any of the young adults here. We'd love to get you in contact with the people. Uh, you also get a free copy of Screw Tape, which is a pretty good incentive. So if it does not apply to you and you will not be attending, uh, but you still want to support, let me know. Many of us are not broke college students anymore, but we will still take free home cooked meals. Uh, so by all means, please talk to us. We would love to just chat about it, uh, get more information out there. Uh, we're so looking forward to it. We'll start up in January. Uh, date is kind of TBD right now, uh, but definitely reach out to Gabby for information and organization. Hey Lou. Yes. Are there ways the non-young adults can uh -huh. contribute in some form of fashion? Oh yes, oh, absolutely. Uh, again, food. Food would be fantastic, honestly. Um, but past that, really there's not too much. Uh, prayer is always going to be appreciated. This is something that is a passion project, I think, for a lot of us. Uh, we want this to grow and just be a great community for those people that um, you know, kind of came out of college, uh, maybe didn't really have a place to go. So that's kind of the point of this. We're pumped about it. We hope y'all are too. Spread the word. This is going to be a big word of mouth thing. Uh, so if you know anybody at all, please just get a, get a message out to them. Hmm? Right. Totally. So for the first one, when it comes to like age range, um, we're, I mean, I'm a mean guy, but like, you know, we're not going to be like, oh, actually you're, you know, a day older than a set range or something like that. Um, this is for anybody that is in college, out of college, married, not married, whatever it may be. Uh, we're not setting very strict limits on this. Is that fair? Yes. Very cool. There we go. So no strict limits. Uh, if you want to be there, we are going to welcome you no matter what. Uh, this is not something that, you know, it's like a, you have to be this age and you can't be there. Not your dad. No, I mean, apparently my dad can go, but he just wanted free gifts. Um, <laughs> so, what did you make it out with? Like a taco game or something? Taco Cat. It's a yeah. card game called Taco Cat. There you go. Yeah. So, he was very happy about it. Um, <laughs> and the second one, which is called supporting in general. Um, Totally. So this will be a weekly event that we do, uh, probably Thursday night or Sunday night. Still figuring those details out. Uh, but it and where will, will it be? It'll be the Soli Deo Center. Which the, the theater building. building. Across there. Um, we'll be there for the first couple times. Uh, if we end up outgrowing that, it is a relatively small area. Uh, we'll move somewhere else, maybe on campus, maybe not. But that's not for a while, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, but if y'all are free that week, and like, hey, I'm feeling froggy and want to make some food for them, let me know, let Gabby know, uh, we can get you our numbers, we will take it more than, more than happily. Uh, outside of that, if you just want to feed us at some point, we're also not going to complain about that. Um, but at the end of the day, this is about growing community, uh, not just with Indian adults, but also with the greater church. So any kind of time, taking us to lunch after, after church, stuff like that is going to be awesome. Hi, Luke. Yes? If I'm feeling froggy, how um, do I feel? How are you, if you're feeling <laughs> froggy? <laughs> Yeah, well, look, look at look at Steve right there. He's feeling froggy, clearly. You know what? I, I think. I don't. I think if I think maybe since she's feeling froggy, since Peggy's feeling froggy, maybe she should be able to wear that that frog necklace. Yeah. Froggy. I don't know. One of my professors in college used it, and yeah. I honestly don't know the entire. Feeling thing. jumpy. If you're feeling like, jumpy. Excited, yeah. you know. Yeah. Overachieving, maybe. Not, not so. ready to croak yet. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then what, was there one up there? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, now I just feel cool and hip, I guess. Uh, so I we'll take it, you know. <laughs> That's about it. This is a long, long word ministry. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and amen, everybody. So we are, as a class, going to support it. Okay? Let's commit now. We're going to support this group in any way we can, primarily food. We are going to do everything we can in our power to support this group. And it's going to be a success, and we are behind it 100%. Yeah, and one of the uh, encouraging things is last night it was originally set to be at the Fesco's house, and so many signed up for it that we ended up moving over to the Mayfield's um, Mayfield's house. Great turnout last night, and y'all, honestly, this is just a great group of young adults that uh, that I've gotten. Now, many of them are in our our class here, and some of them are over in, in Lee Eric's class. But just a great group of young adults here. 
And then again, this is a ministry that is long, uh, long overdue. Um, also, somebody's Sam's Club card was left at our Sunday school party uh, the other day. Uh, I appreciate it. I've been able to use it all of this last week. So that, I hope that's no big deal. Is that yours? All right, here you go. Awesome. Okay, y'all, one final announcement uh, before we get going here. And we're going to jump into the text of Scripture. But this is uh, something that Doug Powell and I are excited to let y'all know about. And hopefully we've got all the text set up so that it will uh, work properly. Um, we're going to jump into the text, jump into our lesson here for a second. But if you'll turn your attention uh, to the screen behind me here. Welcome in. I'm Doug Powell. And I'm David Hilson. And we are the Doctrine Dudes. And uh, we are starting up a new podcast here that uh, was inspired by uh, David's classes that he teaches at Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And I kind of uh, sit in for him from time to time. I'm more the Ed McMahon, uh, as uh, if, if you are old enough for that. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, essential doctrines of the Christian faith. And instead of doing it in a systematic way, uh, from the most important to the least important, we're going to actually be um, uh, paralleling the things that we're doing in the class. And so our uh, first series, which might seem like an odd one to start off with, is on angels and demons, what they are and what the Bible says about them. Yeah, so uh, at Christ Presbyterian Church, where we both uh, are elders and teach, uh, and Doug's more than like an Ed McMahon, it's more like, you know, when Tom Brady was starting to the game years ago, and then everybody wanted Tom Brady to be the quarterback. That's what happens when he teaches for me. Like, if I'm out traveling, he teaches, I come back the next Sunday, people are like, David, why don't you just stay going a little, a little bit longer so Doug can keep teaching. Anyway, we are in uh, the Beautiful Word Sunday School class, and maybe we can say a little bit about the name Beautiful Words here in just a second, but the Beautiful Words Sunday School class, we're going through a new series on angels and demons, which is falling between our lengthier series that we just finished on uh, Genesis and uh, coming up, the book of, of Exodus. And so it fits because you see uh, angelic and demonic activity in both Genesis and Exodus, it's fairly prominent actually, so we thought we'd do sort of a parenthetical study, a kind of an excursus on angels and demons. Part of the reason for that too is uh, in my work at Christ Presbyterian Academy. I had the privilege of doing these Q&A sessions with middle schoolers and upper schoolers, and invariably, there's always a predictable set of questions that come my way when I do these Q&A sessions. You know, assurance of salvation, how can I know I'm saved? Tell me about the doctrine of predestination, demons and dinosaurs. I say it's demons and dinosaurs, angels and assurance. Those things are always being asked by kids, and the reality is, Ask the folks in the science school class, how long has it been since you have done uh, an in-depth study and sort of gone down the, the angelic rabbit hole? We have all these misconceptions about angels in our culture that are uh, sort of foisted upon us by uh, sort of um, you know, new age kind of conceptions of angels and spiritualism, and, uh, or, or maybe just kind of doe-eyed precious moments figurines. Uh, we have those conceptions of, of angels that are not biblical, so what we want to do is uh, a really thoroughgoing, uh, what we call a biblico-systematic study, where we're looking at the text of Scripture from a biblical, theological, redemptive, historical standpoint, how we see Christ in all Scripture and God's plan for redemption from Genesis straight through to the maps, looking exegetically at the meanings of, of words and phrases, and then also looking at it uh, from the standpoint of systematic theology. How, how does angelology, both uh, elect and non-elect angels, fit within uh, the broader scope of, uh, of Christian theology. Uh, I don't even know how to respond to that. That sounds so good. I want to be in that class. Uh, that's why I go to You're going to teach class. that class with me. <laughs> you better be in the class. Uh, so uh, the, the, the... All right. So anyway, that's Doctrine Dude. It's going to be... It is right now live on like five or six different podcast uh, platforms already live so whatever podcast platform you subscribe to uh, go ahead and subscribe to that and you'll get a regular dose of Doug and David's show and then I want to also let you know that as of right now right now in your inbox 
the link to the first, the inaugural episode of, uh, of the YouTube edition of Doctrine Dudes is in all of y'all's inboxes if you're on the uh, Beautiful Words Sunday School email list. And so we're aiming to get these out every couple of weeks. We will roughly parallel what we're doing in class, uh, expanding on that. Think of it as sort of Sunday school scraps. Uh, but we're also going to look, say when we get to the book of Exodus, we'll be looking at some of the theological themes in the book. I love what's going on up here. Y'all are checking, you're checking your inboxes. I love it. That's awesome. See, I told you, Doug, this is going to take off. We've already been talking about merch, a merch line. We're talking about <laughs> t-shirts, pint glasses, mugs, stickers. Doug even, Doug even talked about maybe a Doug Powell action figure. So bobbleheads exactly bobbleheads of two knuckleheads all right y'all hope you're excited about that spread the word it's just going to be a way of sort of expense yes we need to have beanies don't we that's a great idea because y'all look at that y'all make me y'all make me wish i was wearing a beanie right now that's awesome y'all rock it all right we're going to jump into the text here luke chapter one we're going to pick up where we left off last week. I'm going to make a couple of comments to reorient us. Uh, we had last week the privilege of hearing from Westminster Theological Seminary student uh, with Jay and Layla. They were here. I know you loved uh, getting to hear their story here, their testimony of how the Lord is working in their lives. And, and so we gave a fair amount of time to that last week. I want to go ahead and jump in and see if we can make it through our handout today. As I said last week, Luke is writing an orderly account. He says to Theophilus, I am writing an orderly account of the things that have been transpiring in our midst. And so he writes a two-volume orderly account. But though it is an orderly account, it is not a systematic theology. It's a story. As important as systematic theology is, Luke writes a story in two volumes. And this story begins with an angel coming to visit an unsuspecting young woman, uncelebrated unknown, an unassuming town uh, 15 miles west of the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee. Ain't no Starbucks there. Ain't no Target there. There's no Target with the Starbucks in the front of it there in this town, little Bethlehem. Micah 5 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are least among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one whose origins from old, from ancient times, will be ruler over my people, a little map dot of a town, and this unsuspected, uncelebrating, uncelebrated young girl, probably somewhere in her mid-teens, 14 or 15 years of age, and an announcement is made to her. His name is Gabriel. Now, as I've said uh, already, and as you heard me uh, intimate there, we have a rather strangely um, I would say evolved, but rather devolved view of angels and demons for that matter. Whether it's C.S. Lewis, uh, screw tape telling Wormwood, and again, the, the, the young adults are going to be studying the screw tape letters after the first year. And one of the things that screw tape says to Wormwood if people have this conception of us that we are comical creatures walking around in red tights with a pointy tail and pitchforks, let them keep thinking that way. Because they'll realize they are too sophisticated to believe in that. Therefore, they're too sophisticated to believe that we exist. And so they can continue their subterfuge. Or when it comes to the angelic realm, uh, maybe when you think of angels, you think of a little chubby, bare-bottomed Cupid shooting his arrow at Valentine's Day or a, a doe-eyed precious moments figurine. And yet, when we encounter Gabriel here, we see on display what we read in Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. At base, the purpose of an angel, the mission of an angel as a mighty one, an angel is a mighty one of God whose sole purpose is to obey the voice of the Lord, to obey the word of the Lord. And so Gabriel comes and he actually has a couple of visits that he needs to make. In chapter 1, verse 13, he visits Zechariah, you will recall. Zechariah, who is an Old Testament expert. Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple of God. And he comes to Zechariah. And of course, as is usually the case, the first thing that an angel has to say when a human being encounters him is what? Fear not. And he says to Zechariah, you are going to bear a son, you and your wife Elizabeth. Again, much the way we see in Genesis 12 to 17 with Abraham and Sarah, beyond the age of childbearing years, Zechariah was quite surprised as well. 
And you will recall Zechariah challenged Gabriel. He challenged Gabriel. You got to give me a sign that this is going to take place. And Gabriel didn't say, okay, let me see what I can do. Let me see if I can give you a satisfactory sign. You know, you know the sign that Gabriel gave to Zechariah? He said, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of Yahweh. I stand in the presence of Yahweh. I stand in the presence of the Lord. It was at that moment Zechariah knew he had screwed up. And the sign that was given to this priest whose stock and trade were his lips. He spoke, he taught, he preached, he pronounced blessing. And the sign that was given was that he would be silent throughout the duration of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And then later his tongue was loosened. But imagine being Zechariah and you have just said to this fearsome creature who just had to tell you not to be afraid, give me a sign. He says, I am Gabriel. You do not understand with whom you were speaking. Much the way Moses in Exodus 3, when he says, whom shall I say sent me? And the Lord says, I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. Later Moses would say, I want to see your glory. And like Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, the Lord said, you can't handle the glory. You can't handle the glory. It was David Wells who wrote a book. God in the Wasteland, which he wrote back in around 95, 96, after his 1994 uh, inaugural book in this series called No Place for Truth or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology. It opens, that book opens, when we believe in nothing, we open the door to believe in anything. When we believe in nothing, we open the door to believe in anything. The sequel to that book, God in the Wasteland, he speaks of the weightlessness of God. The weightlessness of God. And by that, David Wells is not speaking of John 4.24 where, where John says that God is a spirit. He's incorporeal. He's non-material. Of course, the second member of the God has eternally enfleshed. And in terms of his humanity, his glorified humanity is material. And yet God in his essence is immaterial. He is spirit. But that's not what David Wells means when he speaks of the weightlessness of God. By the weightlessness of God, he means that God rests all too inconsequentially on the church today. We take him far too lightly. We take God far too lightly. Zechariah is taking Gabriel lightly. And then he was instructed. This announcement is made to Mary. Of course, her response was not, give me a sign, but she was curious, how can this be? Since I have never known a man. This was not rebellion. This was not demanding a sign. It was understandable curiosity with the Old Testament expert who should have known better. He rebukes him with this young, assuming girl who had found favor with God, who had been graced. And I'll say more about that in a second. He is very tender, very gentle with her. He says to her, greetings, O favored one. Kikaratomene in the Greek, graced one. It's not, Mary, you are so full of merit that you have earned. You have merited a hearing with God. No, you have been graced, Mary. You're full of grace. Because that grace is not something that you came standard feature with. It is, it is God's favor toward you. And it's, it's just like you and, and just like me. We are all uh, much graced. I mean, that's what the whole... Bible is about really Genesis straight through to the maps. But in Ephesians chapter 1, right, God predestines us by His grace. What, what is the doctrine of predestination and election? But God's forever grace and love for you set upon you before you were even born. Why we have such a problem with that, I'll know. Oh, I do know actually. It's because of my arrogance and my pride. It's my unwillingness to say, oh God, you are God and I am not. You are God and I am not. You chase me. You pursue me. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul out of the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. But Mary is shocked. Uh, Michael, and we'll say more about him in just a second, is a warrior angel, the archangel. But Gabriel is the one chosen to make this announcement, both to Zechariah and to Mary. And she's confused because men in that society don't speak openly to a woman, uh, but, but an angel. And so he comes to lowly Nazareth. Again, not some sprawling metropolis. Um, 
Christ's humiliation, you ever thought about this? The humiliation of Christ does not begin with the scourging and the cross. The humiliation of Christ begins with a little town called Bethlehem. To us, Bethlehem is it's heartwarming. It's sweet. We sing about Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was nowhere. And if you were from Bethlehem, you were nothing. His humiliation begins even there. See, the Lord delights to use small things. The Lord delights to use small things and to show His grace and His glory and, and weakness. <laughs> For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, Yet he became poor for your sake, so that by his poverty you may become rich. And so Gabriel comes with this glad acclamation, greetings, O favored one. Now, a couple of things here. Gabriel, the, the Hebrew word here, uh, Gabriel, you see it in Daniel 8, verse 16 and 9, 21. It is a proper name, Gabriel, a proper name, for, for this angel. You see it also in Luke 1, 19 and 26. If you look in your handout there, you'll see that, that the English Gabriel is just a transliteration of the Hebrew and, and the Greek. We want to distinguish between Gabriel and Michael. And I think this is a good, a good place to start, given that we are in Advent, for understanding the angelic realm. Before, in the weeks ahead, we look at the attributes of the angels, the, the mission of the angels, the various kinds of angels and, and designations of angels in the Bible. Let's just consider uh, Gabriel and, and Michael. So Gabriel appears in the Old Testament, Daniel 8, 16 and 9, 21, um, as well as here in Luke 19, 19 and 26 of, of chapter 1. And uh, there are some, interestingly, that deny that Gabriel is a proper name and see this as a rather common noun, meaning the man of God, uh, which is just sort of used generically for an angel. But, but this actually can't hold. In fact, some uh, have in the history of interpretation suggested that um, Gabriel might be the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and Michael was the second member of the Trinity. Um, that's utterly impossible to sustain uh, biblically throughout. They are, they are separate people. I mean, the, the very fact that Gabriel is announcing the birth of another. He is announcing the birth of another and naming him uh, Emmanuel. But uh, Abraham Kuyper helps us with this. Uh, Abraham Kuyper, who lived from 1837 to 1920, uh, wrote a book called The England Gods. The England Gods. This is actually a first edition of, uh, of Abraham Kuyper's book on angels. There was a time when theologians thought deep and long about doctrines that sometimes we take for granted. An entire book, an entire treatise on the doctrine of, of angels here. Um, and this book I, I was given recently, some friend of mine gave me uh, a whole host of, um, of Dutch works to kind of build out my Dutch library. Uh, in, in, in my study. If you ever come to the Hobbit hole, you can check them out. But I'll shake you down before you leave. Mace. I know, I know, I know. i got my eye on you, man. Um, some of y'all are book sniffers just like I am. I'm watching you. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like Roz in uh, Monsters, Inc. I'm watching you, Mason. Always I'm watching. <laughs> of the... Uh, of the languages that I've, that I've had the privilege of, of studying uh, over the years, um, Dutch is, is probably the hardest. Anybody read Dutch in here? Anybody read Dutch? It truly is the, the hardest. I thought the hardest thing uh, to learn was how to translate Latin poetry. Truly, Latin poetry is very difficult. Dutch is a, is a whole, different, whole different thing. But uh, here, Abraham Kuyper is writing about Michael and the idea that, that Michael is actually the second member of, uh, of the Godhead. And he says that it's actually a, an impossible position, an impossible position to hold. That there's no way that we can say that Michael is, uh, is Christ or is the second member of, of the Godhead. And, uh, and he says this, De Christus heben te verstan is het jut het bonifestande elzu de dulek dit Michael Athens her nekt. 
als de Christus verkumt. You can't say this of Christ. Nicht. You cannot say that Michael is the Christ. Why is that? Because um, Michael is called the head of all principality and powers. All right? That, that, that Michael is the chief, right? Of the, he, he's the archangel. He's the one angel that we know of who's called the archangel. And so you can't say that he who is the chief of princes can be equal to the one who is himself the prince of peace. And so all throughout the scripture, both Michael and Gabriel are distinguished from the second and third members of, of the Godhead. And yet, there is something, I think, admirable in that struggle to try to identify Michael and Gabriel, to give them their due, to see the, the not the innate divinity, but the reflection of divinity. I mean, there, there's a sense in which when Zechariah says to Gabriel, I need a sign, and Gabriel says, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of the Lord. What, what is it when we consider the, the angels and the brightness of the angels, but a reflection of glory? They are in the presence of glory. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod. It means weightiness or heaviness. You ever known someone who walk in a room and their personality is such that there's just a weightiness to their presence? In the Old Testament, the, the glory of God is the weightiness of his character. And in the New Testament, the word doxa, doxa, the word for glory. When we sing a doxology, doxa logos, we are singing a word of glory. Do you know that? Doxa, radiance, brightness. There is a brightness to them. Michael, we read of him in Daniel 10, 13, and 21. Uh, and in Jude 9, uh, Michael, the archangelos. The Greek word there, archangelos, the archangel. We read of him in Revelation seven, uh, Revelation chapter twelve, verse seven, and uh, literally uh, the word Michael, who as God, L for common designation for God in the Old Testament, Michael, who as God, um, this angel Michael. And we'll be seeing more about the names and designations of angels in the weeks ahead. But he is uh, seen in places like Daniel and Jude and Revelation as a warrior angel. A valiant warrior angel fighting the battles of, of Yahweh against the enemies of Israel. And so he is, you know, Michael the archangel is kind of like King Aragorn, right? He is the chief among the, the warrior angels angels and now it's it's conceivable that there are simply uh, ranks among angels that remain a mystery to us and we'll do our best to to discern from scripture the ranks of the angels and the designation of uh, of the angels but but there you have it with with michael and and gabriel but the beautiful thing here is that there is an announcement that gabriel has to make and this time of year we need to visit this announcement of gabriel it is an announcement of a virginal conception and we think this is an announcement of a virgin birth it is that but it is also a virginal conception have you ever conceived of that that the announcement was of a virginal conception as well as a virginal birth j gresson major who lived from 1881 to 1937 wrote a book entitled the virgin birth of christ in a day and age in which the church was denying things like the virgin birth in fact you're sitting here right now if you'll bear with me, you're sitting here right now because of the events that were transpiring from around 1910 to 1924. Around 1910, uh, a couple of attorney brothers in L.A. who were uh, well-resourced funded a group of theologians to author a set of essays called The Fundamentals where they wrote defending things like the inerrancy of Scripture, the miraculous claims of the Bible, the exclusivity of Christ for salvation, the doctrine of the Trinity, the humanity of, of Christ, the incarnation, and the virgin birth. Why? Because at that time, in the Presbyterian church in this country, those very things were being denied. By 1924, over 2,000 Presbyterian ministers signed what was called the Auburn Affirmation. Okay, that has nothing to do with Auburn, Alabama, something War Eagle fans in here. Please don't uh, get angsty with me here. But the Auburn Affirmation was signed in New York. Over 2,000 
Presbyterian ministers signed this affirmation that said, you can be a Presbyterian minister in good standing even if you deny the virgin birth, even if you deny the inerrancy of Scripture, even if you deny the exclusivity of Christ for salvation, even if you deny these essential Christian doctrines that Doug and I will be talking about in the weeks ahead on Doctrine Dudes, smash that subscribe button, hit the like bell, all right? These things that we're going to be talking about, these crucial doctrines of Christian faith, over 2,000 ministers said, you can be a Presbyterian minister in good standing even if you deny these things. 1924. By 1929, J. Gresson Machen realized that the denomination and its main seminary, Princeton, had gone apostate. And so he started Westminster Theological Seminary. And then in 36, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which was a confessional Presbyterian church largely in the Northeast that was responding to that, you flash forward some four or five decades, 1973, in a little town called Birmingham, at a church called Briarwood Presbyterian, the PCA was born for the very same reason. Because we were looking around and seeing that the doctrinal tethering of faithful men and women and boys and girls had been severed. You are here right now. Because of the efforts of guys like Machen fighting for things like the virgin birth. And he says, but the two elements of Christian truth belong logically together. The supernatural person of our Lord belongs logically with his redemptive work. The virgin birth belongs logically with the cross. Where on aspect, where one aspect is given up, the other will not logically remain. And where one is accepted, the other will naturally be accepted too. If we give up the virginal conception and birth, it's not just that we're finding it hard to think that something that is biologically normative in our experience, God is incapable of doing his thing there. It's not just that we're struggling with the idea of the miraculous. What we're actually giving up if we give up the virgin birth is the divinity of Christ. And if we give up the divinity of Christ, we are giving up the cross. If we distort Christmas, we invariably distort Easter. A book that's in my library that's exceedingly precious to me is uh, it's a two-volume set. Actually, four books in two physical volumes. This is uh, John Calvin's uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion. And this is the 1559 edition. There was a 36, a 39, a 41 French, and a 59 edition here. And uh, this edition here, I want to read what I think makes... <laughs> Diane, this is... You didn't see this. <laughs> This is from a long time ago, long time ago. It's vintage, it's, it's vintage, yeah. I want you to, I want you to listen to this. Okay, just, just, just to take a second here. Why was the angel Gabriel coming to Mary? What is Christmas really about? Christmas is this, for the same reason it was also imperative that he who was to become our Redeemer be true God and true man. It was his task to swallow up death. Who but the life could do this? It was his task to conquer sin. Who but very righteousness could do this? It was his task to rout the powers of world and air. Who but a power higher than world and air could do this? Listen to this. Accordingly, our Lord came forth as true man and took the person and name of Adam in order to take Adam's place in obeying the Father, to present our flesh as the price of satisfaction to God's righteous judgment, and in the same flesh to pay the penalty that we had deserved. In short, since neither as God alone could he fill death, nor as man alone could he overcome it, he coupled human nature with divine that to atone for sin he might submit the weakness of the one to death and that wrestling with death by the power of the other nature he might win victory for us. Gabriel came to announce Yeshua. In the Hebrew, Joshua, the Lord saves. Jesus, the Lord who saves. He is great, Isaiah 12. He is the son of the most high. Isaiah 11, 1 and Jeremiah 23. This is in fulfillment of the covenant made all the way back in Genesis 3.15. We made much of Genesis 3.15, did we not? 
for weeks and weeks, some of you might say for years and years, nearing nigh a decade, David, it felt like we were in Genesis. Genesis 3.15, the seed who would crush the serpent's head. Gabriel comes to say that seed is starting to bloom, Mary. That seed is going to bloom in and through you, and he will save his people from their sins. And this is in fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham in 12 to 17 of Genesis. And when the Lord came to Adam, where are you? And he hid. He comes here to Mary. He says, Mary, where are you in all of this? And what is her response? Her response in the Greek is so beautiful. And Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be. And like mother, like son, like mother, like son, Jesus promised by the, April, by the, the, the angel Gabriel would be just like his mother in one sense, wouldn't he? When the Father's time came for him to endure the cross on our behalf, Jesus said essentially, Edu, Edule, Kiryu, I am your servant, Father. Have you ever thought about just the, 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 startling, the startling surprises? As I said earlier, right? It's so surprising when you see a manger scene. We expect sheep and oxen, maybe a donkey, maybe a camel. You even see those little figurines. Has it ever dawned on you that there was a lion in the stable that night? There was a lion in the stable, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that, that a stable stall could, could house a lion. And he who would drink from his mother's breast would also drink from the cup of his father's wrath. That's why he came. He came, Hebrews 2, 10 to 18, and I'll leave you with this. This is Merry Christmas, y'all. He came to destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all of us who through our fear of death are held in lifelong bondage. The manger put the grave on notice that its days were numbered. As I said to the folks just a few minutes ago at the communion table, I wonder if Mary knew when she laid her precious baby Jesus in the manger that she was actually spreading a table so that we could come and eat. Right? He's laid in a manger given to us to be food from the beginning because the cradle was the first step to the cross. The grave put the manger, the manger put the grave on notice that its days were numbered and so uh, let it be of no surprise to you that Luther would say to us this Christmas, um, take a cue from Gabriel and listen. Humble yourselves like Mary, who would treasure these things and ponder them in her hearts. Be like the angels who, according to 1 Peter 1, are, are on tiptoes longing to look into the gospel that you and I experience. Take a cue and... Uh, and realize that that which puts the Mary in Merry Christmas is that something fierce was laid in the manger for you. His name is Jesus. And when you see that cute little baby in the manger scene, know that you have a king. And if I can end with one more Lord of the Rings reference, you'll indulge me. Spoiler alert. And if you haven't read Lord of the Rings, you know what you need to do, right? You pray about that. And thus shall the true king be known because the hands of a king are what kind of hands? Hands of a healer. You have a healer. His name is Jesus. Gracious Father, thank you that uh, Christmas is but a celebration of a divine Trinitarian conspiracy to do for us what we never could have done for ourselves. Oh, would you give us a sense of wonder and awe as we contemplate these staggering creatures who minister in your presence in the weeks ahead. And I pray that we, like they, would find ourselves insatiably curious 
about the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, Emmanuel, God with us. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Y'all, Merry Christmas. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. We got cookies up here. Please.